And I call on the Cabinet Secretary, Fergus Ewing. Uh, Presiding officer, I'm pleased to have the opportunity this afternoon to set out to Parliament the Scottish Government's proposals for the future management of fisheries in Scotland. And crucially, I want to invite MSPs across all the parties to get involved in the national discussion on these proposals, which I launched uh, last Monday at the Convention of the Highlands and Islands held in Orkney. At a time when very little is certain in the wider policy landscape for fisheries and our coastal communities, this government is determined to provide as much clarity as we can about what the future holds for key sectors affected by the prospect of disruptive change. Put simply, we want to make the most of our waters and to encourage long-term sustainable economic growth for Scotland's rural economy. To achieve this, we will ensure our management approach is underpinned by our commitment to meeting international obligations. Scotland's relationship with the sea is a long and a productive one. From the largest port to the smallest quayside, our fishers and fishing communities take pride in delivering high quality produce in a sustainable way. We must work together to build on that sustainably for the future. I want a truly nationwide discussion on these proposals so that everyone involved in fishing has their say and that we can agree on the way forward. The uncertainty around Brexit makes for challenging times for our fishing communities, for the families whose livelihoods depend on fishing, either far out at sea, in inshore waters, or onshore in processing or other supply chain industries. Of course, I will continue to fight to get the best deal for our fishing interests from Brexit. But whatever form Brexit eventually takes, I also remain committed to continuing to fight to champion Scotland's fishing interests at home and internationally. I'm determined that whatever the future holds, Scotland's role as a world-leading fisheries nation and as a responsible and sustainable fisheries manager will continue. Presenting officer, we've set out eight key principles that will underpin our future approach and will, which will inform our priorities. First, to ensure access to Scottish waters and fishing opportunities is not traded away by the UK government. Let me be absolutely clear. Scotland's rich fishing grounds should not be used as a bargaining chip in Brexit negotiations. We will seek to maximise the economic and social benefit for our coastal communities of this valuable natural resource. So we will hold the UK government to account on its promise to negotiate future access arrangements and fishing opportunities on an annual basis. Second, to expect our industry to continue to fish sustainably in line with scientific advice to secure the long-term future of our stocks. As part of this, we will continue to use total allowance catch TACs to manage most fish stocks in the future and may consider introducing quotas for non-TAC species such as shellfish. Third, we will seek to ensure that quota is distributed and used effectively. This paper outlines our continued support for the FQA system, but also sets out our commitment to ending quota speculation. And where we have additional quota in the future to allocate, our priority will be to incentivize new entrants, to increase the number of people involved in fishing and develop additional inshore activity which supports the economic growth of coastal communities. Fourth, we want to maximize the use of technology and encourage innovation. This will include work to modernize monitoring and data collection for the inshore fleet and proportionate and appropriate use of remote electronic monitoring, both for compliance and for scientific purposes. Fifth, our approach will treat fish and our fishing waters as a national asset which governments must steward and enhance for everyone's benefit. So we'll seek to create and sustain jobs and income for the wider fisheries sector and strengthen economic links between fishing vessels and local communities. We want to see fair work first applied in the fisheries sector and for more of the catching sector in particular to sign up to the Scottish living wage. The aim is to enable more young people to see fishing as a career of choice. But we also know that the sector depends significantly on skilled labour from the EU and beyond. So we'll press the UK government to introduce a new work permit system and ensure that cases of exploitation 
in the fishing workforce are investigated and prosecuted. Sixth, our future approach will combine both continuity, where that makes sense, and change, where a more workable approach is necessary. That means that we'll take a sensible and proportionate approach to minimizing discards so that fishers can live within the rules and fish sustainably. Therefore, we will develop a workable future catching policy which takes account of the different parts of our fleet and avoids imposing a one-size-fits-all approach. Seventh, we'll play our part in managing fish stocks sustainably by continuing to contribute to the gathering of data and analysis about fish stocks. And finally, I believe that the future of Scottish fisheries management lies in increased delegation of local fisheries management functions. And I want to explore how we can give greater responsibility and power to local groups to improve community outcomes. As part of this, I want to consider expanding the role of regional inshore fisheries groups to help deliver more effective inshore fisheries management. So I think also this discussion paper sets out this government's proposals to manage Scotland's fisheries in the future within current devolved responsibilities. I expect the UK government to respect that and to do nothing as it develops its own future management plans to undermine that. Moreover, I expect the UK government to deliver on its promises that our competence will only increase over time with enhanced responsibilities. I'll continue to fight for that to happen, and given the importance of Scotland's fisheries to the UK as a whole, for Scotland to play its rightful role at the forefront of UK fisheries policy and dealings. I hope that this Parliament will support our endeavours in this regard. But with power comes responsibility, and I'm clear that while much might change in the future, how we conduct ourselves in the future particularly in relation to our friends and colleagues from other seafaring nations, will remain constant. We will continue to behave responsibly. We will continue to manage our natural resources sustainably. We will continue to support and work closely with local communities. And finally, we will seek to secure the future of our fishing industry and assets for future generations. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. We turn to questions. I call Peter Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I would, must say I welcome this document, as it is, I think, the first time that this SNP government has had anything positive to say about leaving the EU and leaving the CFP. And I absolutely endorse the statement that we will not trade away access to our waters for access to EU markets. Yeah. There are many important questions raised in the document, and I wish to highlight two, which I would ask the Cabinet Secretary to comment on. First, there is a statement saying there is an aim to stop speculation and quota. Now, that may or may not be a useful aim, but I wonder how does he propose to achieve that? Secondly, one of the biggest threats to our fishermen's future is the discard ban and choke species tying the fleet up. So, what new initiatives and management structures does he plan to put in place to make the discard ban both effective and workable? And in conclusion, as well as important questions, there is much to welcome in this document, as I've said, but it can only come into effect if we leave the EU in a managed manner. Unless we leave, none of the initiatives in this paper can take place and we remain in the hated CFB. Therefore, does the Cabinet Secretary now support the only deal on the table? And will he encourage his SNP MPs to vote for Theresa May's deal tonight? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, I, I thought Mr Chapman started off extremely well, actually. But, um, <laughs> but well, I, I do welcome the, the support that he's given for, for these measures. Uh, and to take his last question first, um, we, we still believe that uh, the proposals on offer from the Prime Minister uh, raise very serious questions for fishing communities. For example, page 38 of uh, the document which Mr Chapman has, has praised details the value of European maritime fisheries funding, uh, 150 million between 2014 and 2020, 10 million for ports, 15 million, 14, 15 million for the processing sector. Uh, 20 million for the collection of fish stock data. I haven't given you everything because I haven't got time. 
There's been so many benefits from the EMF, EMFF for the fishing communities in Scotland uh, that it's difficult to enumerate them, but there is no clarity, presiding officer, on what would replace that, if anything at all, other than it's to be called a shared prosperity fund. Beyond those three words, we really don't have that much clarity. Going to his questions um, on uh, having a active uh, uh, a fishing quotas held by active skippers, the incidence of the so-called slipper skipper has reduced pretty substantially. That is, that skippers who possess quota but no longer fish themselves and through POs lease their quota uh, to others. We uh, believe that measures can be taken, as Mr Chapman has identified, it says so in the paper, to tackle that by the use of licensing powers so that licenses would require uh, the quota to be actively fished and managed. In addition to that, there are provisions for new entrants to enter in the event of additional quota becoming available, and I think that has been welcomed, so far as I can see, across the whole sp spectrum. Uh, he also asked, and finally, presenting officer, to try to answer all the questions, three questions he asked, uh, regarding the discard ban, we do think that the uh, discard ban, as it's applied by the EU and the CFP, is inflexible. It's a one-size-fits-all. We believe that it's important uh, not uh, to throw away fish, dead fish, into the, into the sea. It's an incredible waste, and the public are rightly concerned about that. Uh, but there are better ways, using more discretion, flexibility, and indeed the wisdom and the technology of skippers, such as Jimmy Buchan, who has explained to me a particular device that he has developed for selective, uh, for, for a type of fishing net which uh, uh, catches those fish that you wish to catch and lets others escape. So using all these measures, more flexibility, less top-down, uh, I believe that we can develop a better discard policy, but I do welcome uh, the overall approach that Mr Chapman took this afternoon. Order granted to be followed by John Finney. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I also thank the Cabinet Secretary for prior sight of the statement. And the Cabinet Secretary is aware that quota speculation is a barrier to entry into fishing, with quota changing hands at incredible prices, which are way out of the reach of new entrants. I would like to ask the Cabinet Secretary to explain what action he proposes to take to end quota speculation and whether he would consider looking at community ownership of existing and new quota. This would make sure it remains rooted in the communities that fishing supports. It would not only stop speculation, but also make quota available to local fishing industry and to new entrants to that industry. Cabinet Secretary. A, a yes, well, a very, very reasonable questions, and in respect of steps that we're taking to, re, to reduce uh, speculation, first of all, um, it should be clear that at the current time, the holders of fishing uh, licenses to fish and the right to fish have invested very substantially in new vessels. Uh, they have, I think the legal expression, presiding officer, is a legitimate expectation that that investment is secure investment that will continue to be recognised. And indeed, I, I think uh, that uh, we are on record as stating that any change to that system uh, where it wished to be introduced would be changed that could not be done uh, uh, quicker than seven years. And advice has been received to that effect. We are dealing with property assets that have been built up by the efforts of individuals uh, in uh, a risky, uh, dangerous venture over time. Uh, but having said that, as I set out in a min minute ago to Mr Chapman, we do believe that by using the powers in respect of uh, licences uh, and future quota that we are able to do uh, several things. One <coughs> is to facilitate new entrants coming into the industry. Second is to consider the possibility of having quota which would uh, attach, if you like, to local communities rather than ind individuals. And third, further to deal with the issue of requiring a, a quota to be held by and used by those who are actively fishing. So I hope in all three respects, those are measures uh, which uh, Rhoda Grant and our colleagues would support. I hope I've answered all of the questions, but uh, I'll check on that later. John Finney to be followed by Mike Rumbles. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for early sight of the document and uh, welcome, welcome the document, particularly in his references to the prospect of a career in, in fishing and the role that that could play in stewardship of the sea.
Cabinet Secretary, I'd seek your clarification on one point, if I may please, and that follows on from the debate that was held in the Chamber here on the 10th of December, where Parliament supported an amendment by my colleague Mark Ruskell with regard to uh, alleged illegal fishing, which uh, met, and the Parliament agreed to calls for, and I quote here, robust vessel tracking and monitoring technology on all Scottish fishing vessels. And the Cabinet Secretary stressed, stressed the phrase proportionate and appropriate use of remote electronic monitoring. Can you just confirm that that's not him reining back on all fishing vessels, as was agreed by Parliament fairly recently? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, no, there's no uh, reining back. Um, on, on the contrary, um, many vessels already have uh, this uh, equipment fitted and in use. And <coughs> without going too much into the technicalities, there are different types of equipment which do various things. But the general idea is to be able to have a record of where a vessel is fishing at any point, pinpointing the location of the vessel, so that if there's a dispute uh, about uh, the whereabouts of the vessel, for example, that if uh, impinged on a particular feature in an MPA, then the skipper, if he says, well, I wasn't there, is able to prove that by reference to uh, digital equipment. That's a, a benefit, I think, for everybody, for compliance and for the interests of the individual fishermen. Um, <coughs> I met with representatives from the scallop sector in January uh, and resounding support was given for our proposals to deploy enhanced monitoring and tracking technology throughout the entire scallop dredge fleet. And this will put Scotland at the forefront of enabling these technologies to do their job. Uh, and we'll be consulting on the details of the scheme shortly and we intend to help pay for the costs associated uh, with it. Uh, using, I believe, our funds from Europe. <coughs> Mike Grumbles to be followed by John Mason. Um, the Cabinet Secretary has said in his uh, discussion paper on page 11 that Scottish ministers want the power to raise a Scottish seafood levy. However, can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that this would be instead of the existing UK seafish levy and not an additional levy? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, we, the, the, the detail of the quantity uh, uh, of the, the quantum of the amount of any levy in the sector is something that I think we need to have a discussion about. I think what matters is, the, is a fair contribution uh, from the fishing sector. Why? Because that levy is then used to market the fishing sector. And I think there is, um, I've detected at any rate, a sense that a lot more could be done to market in certain foreign markets, for example, Japan, uh, high quality Scottish uh, seafood. Uh, and therefore, I think what I would like to see, presiding officer, uh, and this is a discussion document, it's not a formal consultation document where we put forward specific government proposals, is a wide discussion about how much should that levy be, by whom should it be paid, uh, and what purposes should it be achieved? So I've tried to answer that in principle, and I'm sure we can come back to discuss it further. John Mason to be followed by Donald Cameron. Uh, thank you. I think the government has often suggested that uh, we want to remain a good global citizen uh, going forward. And he mentioned in his statement uh, about relationships with friends and colleagues from other seafaring nations. I wonder if he can expand on any of that. Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, the way fishing operates uh, in the North Sea and west of Scotland uh, in the pelagic and demersal sector uh, is that uh, uh, TACs are, are uh, become quotas, producer organizations deal with the administration of this, but there's also quota swaps in between countries so that uh, uh, practical business-like arrangements can be made. And these depend upon goodwill uh, between the fishing leaders in various countries and indeed the governments of those countries. I don't think anyone would wish no, no Scottish fisherman would wish to see his Spanish, French, Portuguese, Dutch, Norwegian counterparts become bankrupt because all their quota is taken away in the event of Brexit. I think uh, everyone recognises that, uh, uh, that any arrangements have to be practicable. And that is why I, em I em emphasise in my statement that uh, we should continue to uh, carry ourselves in a certain way as recognising that we must work with other countries uh, whilst focusing on the paramount need to get the best possible deal for our own fishing, fishermen and fishing communities. Donald Cameron to be followed <coughs> by Maureen Wood. 
Thank you. Um, like Peter Chapman, can I likewise commend the constructive and positive tone of this statement? Chapter 6 of the paper gives justifiable focus to inshore fisheries, which is, of course, the principal sector on the West Coast and in the Highlands and Islands. And the paper rightly identifies the competing priorities within that sector. Can the Cabinet Secretary explain how he foresees tensions between mobile and static interests being resolved? And can he reassure the Chamber that the proposal, or the possibility at least, of suspending or removing licences in cases of conflict will be given very careful consideration indeed, given the potential for such a power to operate disproportionately and potentially in a draconian manner? Cameron Secretary. Uh, well, I Mr Cameron raises a very, a very relevant uh, point, and uh, I'm of course aware that there are, from time to time, tensions and conflicts between um, the certain inshore fisheries interests, scallop and uh, creel, for example. And there's also issues about uh, uh, gear, gear conflict, gear damage, uh, and other matters. What I would, first point I make is that mostly, uh, I believe and I hope, certainly, that in most instances there is uh, local agreement about these things and that conflict or difficulties arise only in a minority of cases. But secondly, where those cases do arise, then I've mentioned uh, remote electronic monitoring equipment. That can also be used to, if you like, pr provide an evidential basis about who was right, who was where, when. Uh, at the moment, if there is conflict about specific episodes, it's very hard for there to be clear, ascertainable evidence that would stand up in a court of law, as Mr. Cameron would be well aware, about what happened and who was where when. A, a remote electronic monitoring equipment will deal with that. Um, we are, of course, looking at a more localized approach to fisheries management and whether greater use of spatial management can yield greater uh, benefits. And these measures, along with research on, on the optimal allocation of nephrops fishing grounds, will help us inform how to make the most out, out of our inshore waters. So I think there's many things we can do. Uh, some of them are set out in Chapter 6, and I would welcome Mr. Cameron's positive approach to this matter. We have about seven questions, seven questioners left, about five minutes. Maureen Watt to be followed by Claudia Beamish. Uh, the discussion paper sets out starkly the importance and value of the European Maritime Fish and Fisheries Fund to Scottish fishing, but also shows how Scotland has been shortchanged by the Westminster Government. Through Westminster's inept negotiation, Scotland has only received less than 2% of the available EU funding, despite us being the fourth largest EU sea area to manage. So what guarantees has the Scottish Government received that this funding will continue, and how will it ensure that the Scottish fishing interests do not lose out in the allocation, allocation of future funding in the UK? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, I think Maureen is factually correct in that I think the statistic uh, is that it's in page 38 is uh, that the assistance from the EMFF to Scotland is less than 2% of the funding available across the EU, despite Scotland having 9% of the EU's sea fishering, fisheries landings and the fourth largest sea area to marry. So I think, you know, uh, Maureen Watt raises a point that is incontrovertibly true, that you know, although the, the funding of 150 million, 14 to 20, has been valuable, it's actually only about a quarter of the pro rata share to which we would have been entitled had we negotiated it perhaps uh, on ourselves, on our, our own account. And I think that does illustrate just how high the stakes are for setting off about where we are at the moment. My job is to get the best deal for Scotland. I do so by working uh, constructively with my UK counterparts. I, I would mention that uh, I have a high regard for George Eustace, although he resigned, uh, and I this morning had a, uh, a pleasant discussion, uh, introductory discussion with his, uh, uh, his replacement, uh, Robert Goodwill, and I will deploy the same approach, but it's very hard to get a fair deal out of the London Treasury, I can tell you that. <coughs> Claudia Beamish to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and the Cabinet Secretary and others have already touched on the European um, a, a maritime Fisheries Fund and the proposed Shared Prosperity Fund. If the UK fails to match the current levels of funding in the longer term, which has, this has been instrumental in delivering targeted funding for, 
for coastal communities. Um, how will the Scottish Government replace this support um, if, if it is a negative reaction by the UK Government and enable smaller fleets to innovate and fragile communities to adapt to a sustainable climate-friendly fishing industry and equally importantly Question, please support please. the processing sector? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, we do need clarity because, as the, as the discussion paper notes at page 39, no decisions have been made on any successor arrangements to TEMFF uh, uh, and in respect of the period post-2020, we do need more clarity. Um, I would emphasise the positive role that uh, uh, fishermen take in respect of fishing in a sustainable fashion. And I also think that it's important that we have a, a, a son of EMFF uh, in order to, to deal with the safety issues. It's uh, absolutely imperative that we look very carefully at the MCA's recommendations in respect of marine safety, especially of smaller vessels. Uh, and that can only really be done if there is some financial assistance to enable us to deal with that uh, task. <coughs> Call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Edward Mountain. Is the Cabinet Secretary aware that uh, with much benefit deriving to the catching sector from leaving the CFP, the processing sector is where the real benefits are delivered for communities. 70% of people are non-UK nationals employed in the industry in the North East. How can he help ensure that people from across Europe and elsewhere continue to be able to come and work in our industry and make the immense contributions they make to our communities and economy? Well, Mr. Stevenson makes an extremely valid point. We can achieve that by uh, having a, a new work permit system or, at the very least, presiding officer, restoration of the previous visa extension system. We uh, also wish to enable the legal employment of non-EEA nationals, such as people from the Philippines in the fishing fleet, and ensure that they have the same employment rights and legal protections as onshore workers, that would be a significant advantage in the alleged maltreatment of workers and we, we must see that the fishing fleet can continue to access the labour it needs. This has really been a very sad and bureaucratic uh, morass of a chapter in our fishing history and it really must be solved. Uh, I note that Mr Eustace, who as I say has, uh, left his post just this morning, uh, criticised the UK's immigration policy uh, in the rural economy as a whole. Uh, so I very much hope that his successor, Mr Goodwill, with whom I discussed this morning, can take that as uh, uh, an early piece of work in his entry, because it's absolutely essential. Lastly, this morning I spoke with, uh, with people, leaders in the food and drink sector, about uh, preparing for no-deal Brexit. One of them was Ryan Scafferty, who, as Mr Stevenson knows, uh, runs a major processing plant. He's on record as saying this, we can have all the fish in the world, but if we don't have the workers to process them, it will be of little avail. Edward Mountain. Thank you, Presiding <laughs> Officer, and I too welcome this discussion document and the Cabinet Secretary's statement this afternoon. I understand the Scottish Government's proposal is to pass all fisheries legislation together, including legislation concerning the inshore fisheries. My question, Cabinet Secretary, is can you confirm that you wish to lay all the proposed legislation before this Parliament during this session? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, I don't want to be picky, but I think I have to be careful about the definition of all. But it's certainly our, in, our desire to legislate in this session for a number of different purposes. The paper talks about the need to update the fishing, inshore fishery strategy of 2015, for example. Uh, but there's other uncertainties in relation to Brexit because the UK Fisheries Bill, with, whom, with which we have had some issues which have not been resolved, as I understand it, presenting officer, it's unlikely to become law prior to the 29th of March and is still subject to the discussion of the UK government with ourselves. So that issue, I think, really needs to be resolved before we can start being absolutely definitive about the future. Safe to say this, that any legislation that, that we require to deal with simply to enable the mechanics of fishing to continue, we will certainly legislate here using our devolved powers, should it, be, should it so be necessary. Thank you very much and my apologies to Emma Harper, to Lewis MacDonald and to Richard Lyle that we weren't able to reach their question this afternoon. Uh, but we have to move on to the next item of business which is a, a debate paper on motion 16257 in the name of Jamie Hepburn 
on the working to make Scotland a fair work nation by 2025. And again, I would encourage all members who wish to contribute to this debate to press their request to speak buttons as soon as possible.